fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Okay, we are back in the House of Mystery. It's going to be a fun show today. Um, Okay, we're not even uh, wasting time with an intro. Um, joining me, of course, is uh, Dr. Eric Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, he's uh, he's here making sure we're all healthy. And, then, and then we've got uh, filmmaker and author John Borowski. Thank you for being here. All right, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to be on your show and hear your voice. <laughs> oh, boy. My nipples are getting hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, right? We were talking about delicious things, so you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it, at my age, it starts with the nipples. It takes a while before it goes down there. At so, you know, <laughs> at sixty, it just doesn't work anymore. Anyway. Well, it's it's a winter thing, you know. They can't both get hard. No, That's right. no, no, at this time of year, no, no. That's yeah, yeah. I'm getting to sixty. You know, that's. That's pretty scary. Oh, don't don't talk about that. You're going to depress me. It's the best part of life to have your uh, was it virility? Don't uh, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm 42. Oh. I'm I'm a long ways away. So. Oh, it's over before you know it. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, what a shame. Oh man, don't, goes don't, fast. Don't let them tell you it's good. It's a great place. <laughs> right. This is wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. Sucks. Right. The, the golden year. Sucks. Oh no, yeah. <laughs> it sucks, and not in a good way. Oh, oh it's terrible. Oh, so um, now, um, you know, um, I was contributing to your John Wayne Gacy movie and all that, your documentary. How is that going? Like, it, it's a long process for independent filmmaker, and it's a lot of work, a lot of money, a lot of time. And yeah. I was going to say with, with, with COVID and, and all this stuff going on, people probably pay less attention and give less and are less supportive. And I don't mean that in a slam. It's just people are in right. a bad place. So um, how is that? Like, what's the overall experience for you now this last year? Yeah, it's been difficult. You know, I was on track to complete the Gacy film by this last summer because I started about a year, year and a half ago. And um, then COVID hit, which, of course, wiped out all the conventions that I go to, all the expos. So that took a big chunk of my income and time, you know, and promotion, of course. Um, but the film, you know, of, of course, everything, you know, the brakes were hit. Everything was put on hold. And even recently, you know, about a month or two ago, I had an appointment to go and uh, see historical archives, and then uh, when I was the day or the day before, I was called and they said, look, we only have four people here. One has COVID. Now we have to shut down. So I don't know what to tell you. So, you know, it's still continuing. And, you know, I wasn't able to interview people because that's in person. You know, I mean, everything. The only thing I could do was, you know, basically anything I could do on my computer. But then, you know, when the numbers went down here in Chicago, I did do some more filming, interviewed about three more people, and now I figure, okay, it's winter, so I'm just going to spend the winter editing the film to a finer cut, and then hopefully next year, you know, finish it up, wrap it up. But it's been difficult. You know, the fundraiser has stalled. It's still operative, you know, but of course I understand it's tough for everybody right now, you know, especially gig workers and unemployment and everything that's going on. But, you know, the, the saving grace is really the Internet. You know, there's a lot of stock footage out there now. There's a lot of actually free things on YouTube and the Internet. Um, the other day I was just searching YouTube and somebody uploaded these great shots of eight millimeter projector loading and projecting and all this stuff. And it's like, well, 
I have that now. I don't even have to get a projector or an actor. It's like I have that. So, you know, it, it has its advantages, I think, you know, that what we're going through right now. And, and, you know, I'm doing the most I can, you know, from my office and editing the film. It's kind of turned into a bigger project because I want to cover as much territory as I can. So at this point, I don't know if it's going to be a film, a long film, which I may have to split up or a miniseries. Mm-hmm. I, I was going to say, you know, when you, when you, um, boy, when you get um, a lot of things off the internet like that, some of it's free, um, some of it's there for all of us, right? I mean, yeah. I think in a hundred years, everything we do right now will be free somewhere for everybody. Yeah. But when you're doing that, how do you stay above the, the competition? And I don't mean that in a, you know, money direct way or something, but because you want to do something that's unique to yourself and to what you do. Yes. So, so what, what I'm, I'm going to say, isn't it really hard to get that? It is. Yeah. And, and right now that's the situation I'm in. So what I'm doing is since, you know, I'm still editing the film and everything's kind of going on the lockdown route again, you know, what I might do is just put some filler shots in there. So, you know, like some of these stock footage companies, they'll allow you to download a low resolution version of a clip. So at least I could throw that in my sequence and then see what I'm working with, you know, rather than just an empty spot there. So at least there's some sort of visual there. I may not use that in the end, but at least there's something there to give me or if I want to show it to someone, an investor or a distributor, to say, okay, this will give you an idea of what it's going to be like, you know. And then, like I said, I'm hoping sometime next year to wrap it up and then actually finish up the filming, if if possible. You You could always use shots of me if you want. Yeah, (laughs) there you go. There you go. That would be great. You know, you could, you know. <laughs> it's, just, it's, a, it's perfect for a serial killer movie. Yeah, yeah. I can, I, you I can play say. Gacy's father. Yeah, yeah. I, I, no, I, I, I'll play it. Yeah, it's father. Man. See? Man. Well, well, but you know, I mean, that's the thing. Is to think about it, really, it's like, you know, it's it's really, you know, Gacy, maybe some of his associates, but everyone else in the movie is going to be, you know, in their, you know, late teens, early 20s. I mean, because that, that was him, right? It's got to be like that. So, you know, I, all I'm saying is that, you know, I know I'm definitely have going to have to get shots of young guys playing pool and taking their shirts off, stuff like that. You know, it's oh, very yeah. difficult. Very I'm difficult. Not in that, yeah. No. <laughs> no. No, no that's I don't even want to be present. I don't even want to be present when they're doing that, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, uh, you know, the, so now Gacy was a real, real sick guy, right? I mean, because I, I, I look at him and I think, and talking to, uh, you know, I talked to his member's lawyer uh, and that they're putting mm-hmm. together that book. Yeah. I, what, so he, he really hated himself, didn't he, for being gay, really? Yeah. You know, it, it's it's – that that's a big part of the issue you know when you look at uh, i think there are two factors that kind of started to create gacy you know we know about his father being demeaning towards him because he was a little overweight he wouldn't play in sports he was somewhat feminine um you know and of course you're talking the 1950s which you know i have a couple um you know uh, gay authors uh, that i've interviewed and you know we all know that was probably the worst time in america to be gay and you could just imagine where Gacy was hearing the negativity from religion, family, school, you know, society. So, you know, society's view of gays being, you know, dirty, disgusting, bad, and religion, and his father, you know, treating him awful, that kind of created Gacy. But what I'm learning is Waterloo was really where Gacy kind of flourished and his career of crime began in Waterloo, you know, because before I was of the same mind as everyone else saying, well, you know, his father and society, you know, he, he turned that being gay inward. He hated himself because, you know, at that time period, he could, couldn't even, you know, enact his fantasies or what he wanted to do with other men. Um, so, 
Uh, but really, like I said, Waterloo, I found out that's that something happened. He met the right people, I guess, for his character, and they propelled him forward. Now, you know, it might have been members of the JCs, the Junior Chamber of Commerce, which he was involved with. Uh, could have been, you know, some authorities out there in Waterloo who it was said he was giving free uh, buckets of KFC to them. And, you know, he knew what to do. He was a, he was a schmoozer and a con man. And, you know, whatever happened in Waterloo and the people he connected with really propelled him, you know, cause he was on, on course there to start murders. You know, they, they locked him up right when he, you know, was about to start because there was one young man out there, you know, this was happening over a period of eight months out there or more. And they didn't arrest him. You know, he was arrested for five felonies over eight months. Now, why wasn't he in jail when they knew these things were going on? So he obviously had connections out there. Um, but one of the last young men that he assaulted before he was arrested said that, you know, he had shown him some bestiality films of women with animals. And, you know, then he came at him with a knife. And the young kid, 16-year-old, struggled to get it out of his hands. But this was his employer. So Gacy was, you know, the manager of a KFC that he employed this worker at. So the employee is like, okay, well, I figured I'll calm him down. We'll watch some movies again. And then Gacy tricks him into getting shackles and padlocks his hands behind him, an early version of the handcuff trick. So this all started in Waterloo. And then he starts strangling the kid. The kid wet himself and almost passed out, and then Gacy drove the kid home and fired him a week later. So you see he was right on the verge, and this was just one of the victims out there. Another one was uh, Voorhees Jr., the son of a – Donald Voorhees, the son of a Ohio uh, state representative. Hmm. So I, I'll never eat at KFC again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not much of an after KFC. No. no, it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, and, and of course, you know, he had some sort of certificate that, you know, claimed he was some sort of a Kentucky colonel, but, you know, anything they <laughs> could <laughs> use to it, his advantage and, you know, right. show people like, oh, look at me, you know. Uh, do you, but that's do you the think thing. John, it's the absurdity uh, of a lot of this, too, you know. <laughs> Go ahead, Eric. Man. John, do you think um, when you talk about these real savage and brutal figures like Gacy, like you're talking about how his environment sort of made him what he is and the abuse and so forth. Um, do you think there's also an X factor that can't be quantified, like that uh, a layman would refer to as evil, or you don't believe in that? Do you think it's uh, strictly, you know, some confluence of nature and nurture that, that sets a person up to go to these extremes? That's what I found. You know, personally, I don't have a PhD in psychology, but of course I've been studying, you know, these serial killers and aberrant psychology for the last, whatever, 20, 30 years. And what I found is in their formative years, especially between 7 and 12 years old, you know, those are very important times. And they could see something or experience something that may not be abuse, but it could be traumatic. So And these things, you know, Albert Fish in the orphanage, that's where he, at seven years old, he said he had his first sex feeling when he would watch other children in the orphanage being whipped because he enjoyed wow. it. And then he started to enjoy being whipped. That's at seven years old, you know. Gacy with his father and society and, and the struggles he went through. Jeffrey Dahmer, when his entire family left him alone at 18 years old in the house, they're like, bye. They all left him, brother, mother, father, you know, and then you flash forward. And again, it's not an excuse, but it's you could kind of see why he was lonely because his entire family abandoned him, you know, and, and he has these fantasies. And of course, you know, you're talking, you know, uh, you know, 80s, you know, and very difficult for a lot of you know, these serial killers, I see them as souls in torment, too. So, yeah. you know, I yeah. don't believe in the, the bad seed theory because I don't I don't believe a, a child could come out that way. You know, look at Carl Panzram. He was the last child, you know, of a family, you know, where the father ran off. And, you know, she has these whatever six kids on a farm and he's the youngest. Of course, he's going to want attention and act out, you know, on that. You know, one of his brothers later became a police officer. So here you have one of supposedly the, the meanest men or, you know, uh, angriest man who ever lived. But yet a brother of his was a police officer. So Right. You, you got to figure also on the flip side. And I'm, I'm not debating. It just makes me so curious yeah. that when you, when you say Dahmer's family leaves him at a certain age, I got to think, like, what did he do to alienate them? You know, like, there was something creepy already, 
or disquieting. I mean, you you probably know the whole story, but right. It's, it, but I don't yeah, think so. Yeah. No, they were they were okay. dysfunctional. That was the problem. Oh, I see. You know, his mother was drugged up on all these other drugs, so she didn't pay attention to him. The father, you know, when you see him interviewed, he's like on Mars. So here's your son becoming an alcoholic, going to school, drinking alcohol in school in high school. You know, um, maybe mutilating animals. Okay, but. But they don't even pay attention to any of that. So, right. you know, not only that were they kind of non-existent in his life, but they, they basically left him to fend for himself at 18 to pay the bills, to work, things he had never done before. You know, so, you know, I, again, I, I don't think it's that's 100% of it. But here's the thing. Think sure. about this. We, we all know what Dahmer did. Now, if his parents may have nurtured some of his interests what do you think he could have become? A great surgeon, right? Because that's what he, yeah. he, he was interested in the insides of bodies. He was fascinated by it. He could have went in that direction. But, you know, he didn't have that outlet. He didn't go to school. Right. He didn't finish with that stuff. So he did it on his own. Right. And there also, I mean, would have to be the wherewithal to want to help people if you're a surgeon, perhaps. I mean, maybe not. Maybe some surgeons are more strictly technicians, uh, but right. it is, it's an, I mean, that's why you make these films, right? I mean, it's an ever-fascinating it uh, terrain to, like, what goes on inside these people's heads and how come they act like this and most of us don't. Right, and, you know, there's no answers. You know, they're studying brains. They're, there's a school in Florida who's working with children that may show signs of future psychopathy, things like this. But, you know, and that's why I tell people not to shy away from these serial killers and true crime documentaries because at a lot of the conventions I attend, I'll have a mother with a young son or daughter come up to the table and they'll look at the mug shots and stuff. And, you know, and then the parent might say, oh, I'm a little worried about her. She's really interested in this. And I said, you know what? That's great nurture her because she could be a future judge, law enforcement officers, forensic psychologist. These are the people we need to study these serial killers and other, you know, murderers and, and, and victims of crime and, and killers to figure out why they're doing these things. Yeah, it's healthy to, uh, to not look away from darkness, I think, in general. It's like a Buddhist right. principle. I mean, if it's yeah. everything is light, if everything is Hallmark and Disney, you know, you're really like shorting out your awareness of reality in general. Exactly. You know, and, and it's important. It, I, and I always go back to it being historical, psychology, you know, you, and especially when I research for my films and books, you know, it's, it's about the locations, you know, they grew up in, what locations are left. Uh, there's history involved in all of that, the time periods they grew up in. So, you know, it, to me, it's fascinating when you look at all these angles. And like you're saying, you know, it could be discussed from 100 different angles to the end of time, but that's what makes it so interesting and fascinating. Yeah. You know, you know, for me, I had the same kind of upbringing as, as Dahmer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you were abandoned. Just, just so, yeah, no, actually, I, I was. Oh, actually, my right mother here. was in the hospital since I can remember, and then she died. But my father was supposed to take care of us, but he didn't. I, I was at home alone. I'd see him about every two or three months, and he'd drop a $100 bill, dollar bill, which is a lot of money, uh, yeah. on the table and sort of leave me for months. So I, my whole high school experience was all alone yeah but well, and and see its differences you know i was a, a what do they call those latchkey kid my mom worked too and after school i'd have the key and go home and watch cartoons you know but you know again everyone's experience is different you know and that's why we've learned to study these serial killers individually because we all know what happened when profiling came out and they said well you know they have to you know follow this triad they have to do these things but we've we've moved beyond that you know and, and realized that each person has to be studied on their own sure they ha they may have some similarities but you know you really have to study their past childhood how they grew up and you know, their influences. Yeah, I never John, do you... <laughs> <laughs> right, that's a big one, right? Uh, John, do you think anger is a unifying factor, or a lot of them just, like, they pop a gasket, or is that not even necessarily the case? You know, and again, that's an individual thing. I think Gacy, there was a lot of anger in him, obviously, you know, because of the violence. His father was also a violent alcoholic. You know, he saw his father beat his mother up bloody when Gacy was two years old, you know, so, you know, he may not remember that, but, you know, I'm sure he knew the experience, you know, he was there, he saw it as a two year old, you know, and they're, you know, it's violent, it's scary. So, and it's not all of them. I don't think they're all, you know, angry, 
You know, mm-hmm. I, I, uh, some of them, you know, it's, it's an acting out these fantasies. They've always wanted some want domination over their victims. Some like H.H. H. Holmes, it's purely financial. I studied every single one of H.H. H. Holmes's murders. They all came down to an insurance scam. What he could get property wise for someone having sign off property for him. I don't think he enjoyed the killing for H.H. H. Holmes that was planning the murders or We're- getting away with cons, you know, stuff like that. Were they particularly aggressive murders, or did he just take it to the point where he could kill the person and, you know, it was just more functional? That's what it was. It was just, you know, something he had to do. It was like the end result, and he just wanted to be done with it. He loved the planning, the preparing for it, the fooling people, conning people, and knowing he got away with it. The Mm -hmm. murders were just the, you know, the dirty aspect of it that he had to get done because he was a very hands-off murderer. You know, lock them in the safe. They could asphyxiate themselves, or he would gas them or burn them. You know, he wasn't an interpersonal murderer. You know, there may have been some stranglings, but with him it was very hands-off. Whereas a lot of other killers, you know, they say it's more of a communication when they stab or shoot. It's it's this you're holding and, and communicating in a sense with the other person. Wow. So, you know, I talked to uh, Jeffrey Rennick, the retired FBI agent, and he did a lot of those cases and mm-hmm. did a book. And because and, I was doing a book about a guy that was assaulting little girls. Um, and so talking to him, he said over his 40 year Uh, you know, uh, career, um, he found that the age that the people were assaulting was usually the age where they had some sort of trauma happen. Yes. So, so I just wonder if that has something to do with it as well. Like with Gacy, for instance, uh, maybe something, he saw something, something happened to him and he took that, you know, on. Well, and and here's the thing, you know, there are a lot of, you know, you have some serial killers like Dahmer, right, who will sit down and say, I've killed these, you know, victims. Here's how many. Here's what I did to them. Here's, you know, but then you'll have some like Gacy who kind of tells bits and pieces of it at first, but then after it, he wants to play insane and I didn't do these things and he took that with him to his grave. But there are strange things. Like he did work at a mortuary at a funeral home in Vegas. He ran away from home when he was 18 to get away from his father and he worked at this funeral home. He was just transporting bodies to the funeral home. But his mother said in a quote, she said that he told her that he had to sleep in the, in the room where they embalmed the bodies. So, and we all, I I don't know if, if people know, but many times if a male suffers a traumatic death, he will have what they call a death erection. Mm, Yeah. You know, and guess what? Gacy may have brought a teen, male teen that died violently into the, you know, mortuary and may, he may have done something with it. Now, you know, the prosecutor in the case, Bill Kunkel, said he went, flew out there to Vegas, interviewed the owners of the funeral home. They said nothing happened. But come on, they're not there every second. We don't know what happened. So in my documentary, I'm not saying Gacy did this because we don't know, but I'm going to say, they're, you know, when young people die or males, they can have a death erection. And we could just imagine, you know, what he may have done with someone. But I, I'm not saying it happened, you know. Mm. Wow. Wow. That gives yeah. me a whole new. You know, um, moving on with these movies you're making and, and dealing with things, um, generations of men are changing. You know, like the way, the way Gacy grew up in his time. Uh, like I'm old enough to remember that and, and Dahmer and all that stuff. But the people nowadays, like the, the people that are 40 and 30 and 20 live in a different world. So we have a different series of um, killings, I guess. How do you stay up on that? And, you know, and I say that because you look at someone like, like Eric, who's, who's still only like in his early 40s, yeah. um, doing things like the uh, male talks toxicity thing on online you know doing yeah. the crying thing and stuff i don't yeah. <laughs> understand it i really don't understand it because you're such a remove from it yeah it seems like that way maybe because i've got 20 years on you and and to me i kind of think well where does that come from and, and yeah what is that going to do for the men and how they're 
reacting and acting now. I don't know if you get what I mean. Well, yeah. John, let me, uh, to give it some context, John, I, I posted myself crying, myself and a friend, the other day mm -hmm. just to, you know, to mess with the taboo, you right. know, because men aren't supposed to act like that. Right. I do that on Instagram, too. I always put, because I always cry when I'm writing. I'm very emotional. Yeah. So I always put selfies of myself with tears down my cheeks. And we were doing videos, myself and a friend of mine who's an actor, we both got ourselves there. And it was totally to, you know, to trip up the, the gender expectation. It was yes. kind of like an experiment. It definitely makes people awkward. And that's a really great question, Alan, because uh, a lot of these guys you're talking about were definitely entrenched in those sort of gender expectations and the inter internalized self-hatred, all that stuff. Well, you know, but, but again, you know, I th there's – there's many things going on in the world now and, you know, studying a lot of these serial killers in history, a lot of times I go back to the writings of Carl Panzram where he said, you know, and this, he wrote his autobiography in 1928 and he said, what's going on now occurred a hundred years before and it's going to happen a hundred years from now. Everything that he was talking about, you know, the abuses, you know, what's going on in the world, you know, things not changing. Yes, we are making progress. But at the same time, as I was editing my Gacy film, I interviewed uh, his last attorney, Karen Conti. And, um, you know, she's great. She said, oh, we got along like two girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but you know, she says at one point, well, it's very different now. You know, back then, you know, uh, being gay wasn't accepted and all these other things. And then she said, but it's very different now. And then right when I stopped my timeline, I, I went on the Internet because I have heard stories within the last probably like three to five years of things happening. And I searched and immediately three news clips came up probably within the last three to five years that said father killed his son because he right. thought he was gay. We know oh, these things are still happening. These the things are still happening. Yeah. Well, and also you have incels, involuntary celibates. Like, you know, people are always going to find, uh, well, not find a reason per se, but people are always going to be frustrated about something. And also exactly. a big question, John, is has, I, this might sound ridiculous. I really have no idea. Like, do you think the behavior has shifted to mass shootings or is there still the classic serial killer that uh, picks off their victims one by one, and that's still common? Yeah, you know, we get a lot of these things in waves. You know, the the height of the, you know, glory days or the, you know, I forget what they call it, you know, the those glory days of the serial killers when it was between 70s and 90s where you had. Yeah, it's like you know, the golden the, age, yeah. Yeah, right, you know, the golden age, exactly. You know, it is, it's true. You know, that's what we talk about. But, you know. Um, <laughs> the good old days. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Yeah. Right now we can look back and watch Mindhunter and say, oh, yeah, that's interesting. But, man, we would have. Well, we wouldn't have wanted to live at that time, you know. Oh, you're but, locked uh, your doors. I mean, it's terrible. Yeah, right. You know, but um, yeah, you know, it's 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 always uh, you know interesting. I don't know where we were going with that question, but oh, the mass murderers. Yeah, now that's yeah, yeah. the thing. You know, the mass murderers are the thing now, and we don't know if the serial killers will come back. I mean, they are still operating. We know this. I I'm just wondering if the press has learned some lessons in aren't covering this the serial killers as much in detail but you know we do have more technology now we have video cameras we have dna we have all these other things but you still hear these stories like there was recently i think this one guy in i think it was japan where he murdered all these women but he kept them in his apartment and he covered the smell with like kitty litter so you know it's like well he didn't dispose of the body so you know there was no way he could probably have gotten caught unless you know people saw these women coming into his house or apartment because they get smart, too, as technology changes. And as things change, they get smarter. Um, you know, so, you know, we'll see what the next wave is. You know, obviously now we're, you know, everyone's under lockdown, so the mass murders. But, you know, maybe these lockdowns will cause something else. Yeah. Right, right. And they copy each other, too. There's a lot, I mean, it's not like they're all innovators and pioneers. There's a lot of uh, emulating of each other's behavior. So they, it becomes, there's fa fashions to the, uh, the behavior. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Well, and spree shooting, um, you know, yeah. like that, that's something that's very, the, the, that means the culture's got to be very unique as well, because yes. spree shooting is very um, American. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, I mean, you you look at the, the, the what was it, wasn't it the father and son, you know, the, those shooters, and I mean, you, over time, people forget that history, you know, um, the, what was it, the, uh, the California, the university shooter Whitman, you know, I mean, they've always been around. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 
but Whitman was uh, Whitman was one of the first to do what he did, wasn't he? Or was that in terms of I, he was in the uh, yeah. bell tower, right? Yeah. yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah. You know, the first like kind of you know one to try and pick people off like that. You know. Yeah. So what do you look to do? Like you were talking a lot about, uh, like before we were on there, you were talking about um, having to cover new areas um, in in your movies and uh, like with Pazram, like, you know, um, all of the bad things that are going on again in our society. Mm-hmm. Um, so how, how do you, how do you, so how is it you're going to find out your next project? Where do you look? You know, I, sometimes they just come to me. You know, I, I was, before working on Gacy, I was working on the Jesse Pomeroy film, which was put on hold because, you know, the problem with that was it, with the expenses for travel, it was getting a little expensive. So what I did was I said, you know, look, I have Pomeroy footage. I have interviews. I mean, not of Pomeroy, obviously, but I have interviews. So if I could put that on hold and do something local, where obviously I don't have to spend money to fly across the country, get hotels, rent cars, you know, and, and that's been a boon to me that everything's been local, you know, because almost everybody's still here. There are a couple of people that are in Texas that were involved with the case, but everyone's still here. Mike Rossi is still in Illinois. He's like, you know, half hour away from me, you know, so these people are still around. <laughs> Pretty amazing, you know, um, it's it's just such a it's such a now when we talk about independent film making and putting out movies how is that for distribution how is that for streaming how is that for for you, you as know, a movie maker now uh, I, I hear rumors it's always t- you know it's always an uphill battle but changes usually occur within this industry maybe every five years um, when I began. In this industry, well, actually, when I began, I was at the tail end of VHS. So I remember making some Holmes screeners on VHS. Then it was DVD. H.H. H. Holmes was released on DVD, very successful. Basically, what I made, would make on Holmes in 2005 in three months would probably take five to ten years to make now. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's just, it's an uphill battle because, you know, everyone's scared. The distributors are scared. You know, they don't care about the artists, of course. You know, it's, you know, it, I, every distributor I've had, you know, they want you to sign on the line and don't ever bother them. I've been called a bother. Don't oh, talk. definitely am. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, this it's last. It's like uh, a lot of them are thieves. I mean, it's like. Yes, so oh, they are. It's legal larceny. Yes. Yeah, they, it's they, legal larceny. It really is. They exploit you because they know you're on the end of things where you'll get publicity, a degree of fame, recognition, standing right. in your culture as an artist. They know right. these things are important to you, so they know if you uh, – like anything can be characterized as rocking the boat, like you say, being a botherer. You check in, you want a royalty statement, and, you know, it's like, wait, what's wrong with this person? He's a pest. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of my latest films, they pull – Bloodlines, they pulled from Amazon – and um, because then Amazon said, well, people were only watching the first 30 percent of it. So you're going to pull okay. the film. You know what I mean? It's ridiculous. Oh, and then it on, uh, it's on Prime Video Direct where you've it was for Amazon Prime. Yeah. 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 It's the worst. I've had yeah. um, I've had so many things pulled from there. Yeah. And yeah, they, you know. they never give you really that clear an answer. And there's no appeals process. So then, right. like, yeah, you, know, you went to the trouble. You got closed captions. You got artwork and then you're out. Yeah, you know, and it's tough when you're working with distributors, you know, and and it, over time there there's always been conflicts, you know. Recently, you know, I, I I was working with one that you know wasn't really performing well on my title, and I and I went back to them and I said, look, a relationship with a distributor is just like a relationship, a marriage. You know, you get to know somebody. Is it going to work out? It might might not, you know, and it's not working out for us, you know. So then after a while, you know, we were going back and forth. And, you know, we couldn't come to an agreement because I wanted the title back to my, you know, rights so I could do something with it. And then after a while, you just got frustrated and said, well, you know, I'll just give it the film back to you because we're beating a dead horse, you know. But these words they say, they don't realize that it's my life. You know, that last film I made, that was three years of my life, $25,000 budget through Kickstarter. And they say it's a dead horse. You know, yeah. it's like I, I spent ye- four, three, four years on, of my life on this thing. You know, they're just disgusting, really. And I, I'm kind of glad it's kind of coming back to, 
you know, indie filmmakers and self-distribution. You know, I self-distribute right now pretty much everything. You know, I have books. I have the five or six books and my films and TV show. And, you know, it's a lot of work, yes, because, like, you know, I have to spend the entire day editing like I do now the Gacy film. And then at night I fill orders and do my other business that I have to do. You know, but it's, you know, I don't mind. I kind of enjoy it, you know, because then if I'm – totally immersed in my films it's all me you know everything is me i edit it you know i i film a lot of it and you know and and you know it's not handed off to different people sure yeah it's it's a better sort of labor to be there editing and really grinding on the content as opposed to the quote-unquote emotional labor of being uh, ripped off by a distributor i mean it's, you know it's uh you gotta sort of pick your your work yeah, you know, it's a lot of work, you know, but but I'd rather it be that way in the end. You know, I gripe a lot about not having budgets, but then at the other end of the spectrum is, sure, a studio or somebody could say, here, here's a big chunk of money, but they're not going to do that without ties, right? They're going to say, well, you got to do this, it's got to be this length, and you got to throw a sex scene in here, or you got to throw an explosion in here, or we got to have a lot of gore, you know, and it's like, I'm not going to, you know, do something that isn't mine then. Then it's not mine, it's theirs. Well, you could use right, me for precise. the sex scene. Uh-huh. What's that? You could use me for the sex scene. Yeah, yeah there you go. There you go. Right. right. I don't mind that. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a given. There you go. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, well, but, but, you know, but streaming seems to be the way. So if you don't get on right. these streaming services, you, you kind of get left out. And And I say, from my point of view, the stream companies like Netflix and all that, they're all trying to get as much content as much as they can. I don't think they care about what's in it. They just want to get a lot of titles. That's true. Now, now especially yeah. now with, you know, COVID and everything, they just want, you know, it's actually kind of been a boon to, boon to me because there's a um, site called Film Hub. And I've recently just been using that. And I started just before or right when, you know, COVID here here in the U.S. And I think I saw it coming. I wasn't sure. But I said, okay, you know what? I'm just going to put all my stuff up on Film Hub and see what happens. So then what Film Hub does is once you upload your films, they just start getting it out there. That I mean, I, I don't nice. – I mean, I didn't even speak to anyone there, really. It was just uploading and waiting. But now they've got my stuff distributed in, like, eight countries and 15 platforms. My stuff's on Tubi now, Viddy Space. So they're dying for this stuff. So it's actually kind of a good time for me. And when they say now there's going to be more lockdowns, I say, please bring them on because my numbers have just been going up on Amazon, you know. Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> <seriously>. Not <laughs> Yeah. <bad>. Well. <laughs> You know, uh, does that sort of affect you? Does this whole 2020 um, make it, I don't know, how do you say, does it affect the way you actually work? Uh, do, you, do you work darker? Do you, do you write darker? Do you feel darker? Like, do you know, like, it, it, does, your, does your output become different? You know, I, I think it's, in a way it's almost freeing because especially now, it's like I could just sit down and edit whatever I want, you know, without, you know, thinking of, oh, I have to appease someone or I have to make this for a certain crowd, you know, in a sense. But, you know, in a way, this is good because it's made me concentrate on, on editing and, and working Gacy, whereas before I may have been busy doing 20 other things and then never gotten around to editing it. I been I would kept pushing it off but I finally said okay this is perfect because right now I have a mountain of footage I have all these interviews you know I interviewed the two detectives who surveyed and arrested him one of the detectives said I don't know if you could use these he hands me a stack of legal size papers from the first time that they wrote Gacy's confession down, I have the original papers of Gacy's confession the handwritten papers not of Gacy but of the detectives when they were sitting in that room with him that's amazing. Yeah, Isn't and I'm like, great? I could use them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that they, that they trust me. And, and you know, and, and that's the thing, too, because one of the detectives, you know, he called some other contacts, and he was telling them, look, this, there's something different about this guy. Because they know I'm not coming in from Hollywood. I'm not just doing another sensationalistic piece. You know, they could tell I'm into this stuff, and, and it's more, 
you know, real. And, and I'm a Chicagoan. There's so many. And that's the other thing I decided to change course because there are a lot of similarities be, with Gacy and I. You know, I even found out he went to my high school for a short period of time. We're both Polish. We grew up in Chicago on the northwest side. All of these things. The only difference is I might have like 10 or 12 bodies in my crawl space. Yeah, 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 I stole my joke again. Yeah. <laughs> I was, oh, was going to say to do, yeah, yeah, yeah. I always tell people that don't look in the, you know, under the floorboards. You know, I know what done is no. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you got you got to tread lightly when listing the comparisons between yourself and zero. Yes, and exactly. Well, we have so much in common. Yes, right. Well, you know, and that's why I miss the conventions, though, because I would. You know, the conventions would, you know, you're seeing people face to face, you're talking about true crime, and it's like minded people, you know, because we're all in lockdown. But before it was, you know, it, when you're at these conventions, you're talking to people, and having fun. Who's your favorite killer? You know, you don't say yeah. these things, you know, to families around Thanksgiving. You know, it's like <laughs> we're like minded people. We know what we're saying. You know, we're, they're not, we don't put them on pedestals, but, you know, just like people have their favorite sports players or whatever, and you have to have your favorite serial killers. What is John? What is if you have to distill it? I know it's very complex, and it's also your life's work to a certain extent. But what is the precise linchpin of the fascination? Like, what, what is it? Not only for yourself, but at these conventions. Like, why do you think it's uh, it's stimulating? Because uh, most of the horror heads I run into, whether it's true crime or fiction or whatnot, are the sweetest, kindest people, and I found yes. that consistently. So I'm so curious what your answer is on that. Well, to me personally, it was the horror of it all because I grew up watching the classic universal horror films then of course moved on to slasher films so I was a horror nut you know my one aunt would come over and say I could never sleep in your room because I'd have masks and movie posters and you know it was all bloody and gore and horror stuff but I also think the public's fascination with serial killers is that they the public has realized that Serial killers most likely are your next door neighbor in the quiet suburb, that they can be your husband or wife, they can be your son, that, you know, they are just normal people. They're not walking around the streets with scales, fangs, and green skin. They're human beings. And that's my one regret. I only have one regret in my films that I called H.H. H. Holmes a monster, but that was my first film. But then I realized after I made these films and studying serial killers, when these serial killers or murderers step, you know, across that line and are apprehended or put into jail or put into prison or executed, they're still human beings. And it's our job as a society to figure out why they started doing these things and maybe, you know, to prevent these things from happening in the future. But I think it's that duality that people find most interesting. Like how could Gacy be married with a wife and then he's got 28 bodies under the house, you know, while mm. she's there, not all of them were at that time, but you know, how can they con and how can they keep up that duality? How can Dahmer go to work, you know, and have, bring a head, a human head to him with him to work and put it in the locker, you know, things like yeah. that. Well, maybe his wife, wasn't very clean and so <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. well she, no <laughs> i think she wasn't too bright because well, i mean come on yeah. she finds the gay magazines under the the sink she sees <laughs> bringing guys into the garage with a mattress on the floor and a red light in the garage oh they're not playing cards lady <laughs> uh, yeah. oh it's just amazing the, the lives uh, yeah. who are your influences then so when you're making a film like this because uh, we all take from other people, you know, we, we, we watch others and we, we read and we do things. So what, what do you think seeps into your work? To me, it's always, I, I'm influenced by other, you know, um, you know, artistic kind of filmmakers, auteurs, you know, like Scorsese, Hitchcock, um, you know, recently, I think it was last year when 1917, you know, that film, that one best picture came out, I, I had watched it on Blu-ray and I was blown away just by the technique and the acting. And I was riveted that it really, it, after watching it, it, I sat down and I wrote a whole new direction for the Gacy film that incorporates more of the society views of gays and what Gacy was going through and the historical things that were happening. Because you look at the times that he grew up, 50s, 60s, 70s, these were a lot of tumultuous times in the country and there were a lot of things going on, civil rights and gay rights and all these things were happening. Because that's why, you know, near the end, when he was finally apprehended, Gacy said, well, I'm bisexual, because you could kind of get away with it in the 70s 
nineties because it was kind of cool to say that at that time. But you couldn't say that in the fifties. Forget it. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, thank God it's all fine now. Oh yeah, it is. <laughs> Nobody's dying. You know, there are no. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, thank thank God that we solved all those problems and <laughs> yeah. everything's great. I just yeah. the world is perfect now. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but, you know, and, and that's the thing, you know, I, but I'm I'm fascinated by these early cases. You know, Gacy is my most modern case that I'm making a film on, but it presents those problems, too, because I'd rather make a film on a dead serial killer than, you know, one that's fairly recent but has some family members or other people attached to the case still alive because not that they present problems, but it's just kind of like you're going through a minefield, you know. Oh, it's terrible. Yeah. I just finished yeah. that with the with the last book, you know, and, right. and, and it's terrible. Uh, yeah, but, isn't it easier just to say, okay, hey, H. H. Holmes, we could do whatever we want with him, right? But but I'm sure you know you went through that recently too. Oh, it's terrible! It's terrible. Uh, everybody and their dog has to contact you and tell yes. you something, and yes. they love you, they hate you, they call you names, yep. and then other yep. people. It's just the crate. It was the weirdest experience. It was the most stress, and yes. I'll probably never do it again. I know, and that's what I'm thinking. After Gacy, you know, I think I'm going to go even further. Well, I'll probably go back to Jesse Pomeroy because, of course, nobody is involved with that case anymore. But, you know, I, I'm fascinated by that case as well because, you know, here's, uh, you know, a child that, you know, committed these murders by 15. And when they said, what should we do with you? He himself said, put me in a place where I can't do these things anymore. So this was, you know, 18, you know, 70s, very early, you know, or, you know, basically almost no psychology at the time you know so I, I like those early cases when these things are in their infancy why did it take so long the lack of forensics but but then you've got the tried and true detective work that's fascinating like how William King caught Albert Fish and you know lured him out and how you know the detective in the Holmes case found the bodies of the children which I would think is impossible you're going to go based on these letters saying you know here are the states and cities we stayed at but he went basically door to door and found the clues and found their bodies so, so what are we going to do here? Like the justice system, um, we, we don't kill killers in general anymore, right. and we don't really study them. Uh, right. You know, sometimes it's lucky, and we get, you know, you get like that uh, doctor that has the brain, you know, or something. But in yeah. gen- in general, we don't get that. So, and instead, what they're doing is they're coming up for parole. You know, they're getting yeah. get out, or they're getting out of day passes. And I'm thinking, well, this guy murdered six people. How does this happen? So what, what is the, um, what do you think the answer is? I think the answer is, is like that school in Florida that, you know, is because I believe the key is, you know, you have to get at them when they're young. Now, I'm not saying from a Gacy point of view. <laughs> I'm saying that from a psychology point of view, you know, and, and like I said, those are their formative years. And of course we can't do uh, predict future crimes or thought crimes or, you know, those type of things. But there are these signs that we don't know. We can't say, yes, this child is going to be a psychopath or a killer, but there's some extreme actions, you know, um, and there's a New York Times article about that school in Florida where they talk about, you know, how they met one child and, you know, he, he basically said that he hated his brother and he wished he was dead, you know, and this is a little kid, you know, eight, 10 years old, seven years old, it's scary stuff. So, you know, that's what I think. Again, like I said, we do have to study these serial killers. We have to study their brains, their functions, their backgrounds, their environments, and it's all very important. Now, maybe, you know, yes, psychology is very important in these professionals, but, you know, and, and sometimes I, you know, snicker at these, I don't know what they call them now, online sleuths, you know, <laughs> but, but they're, they're doing important, you know, things like, I don't, I'm sure you're familiar with Peter Vronsky and what oh, yeah. he's doing with, you know, Jen Weiss. I mean, they're doing something very important. They're going back to New Jersey and New York and trying to find all of these women who may have been killed by Richard Cottingham and she's spearheading it and her mother was killed by Richard Cottingham. So it, it may be things like this in the future where it's people like you and I working with on some of these cases or with other people, you know, because we're experts in our field in a sense too with what we do as far as knowing about 
you know, what's going on with some of these killers. We may not know all of those intimate details that law enforcement know, but sometimes I feel I know more because especially about Gacy now, they, they have all these files and, and they know these specifics about the case, but I've learned many things just talking to them, interviewing them, and looking at case files as well. I wrote a book with Peter. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, know. I, I love. Yeah, that. yeah, you guys are great. Yeah, you know, and and it's it's a great thing too. How you know usually uh, you know that we could come together and and have respect for each other. You know, but but you know it's a competitive industry too, and there's ego that's involved too. Oh, so. the, the water is warm. There's plenty yeah. of room, and one doesn't really take away from the other because no. there's nothing like when I write something, it's my perspective. When Peter writes something, it's his. When we both contribute, it's ours. It just sort of it, but it's nothing to do with if you and Eric wrote the same theme because we have different, I don't know, different drives. We have different things we want to know. Yes. Yeah, and like John exactly. said, it's, uh, it's historical too. So, you know, you can never get enough history. I mean, there's so many books about Napoleon or Lincoln. I mean, there's always more perspective comes to life. So it is, it's very fertile. Yeah, yeah well. definitely. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I don't like is sometimes it's it's kind of gone over the board, uh, like the commercialization, like the the crime shows that are on TV. Yeah. And and the problem is a lot of people, like you say, those uh, sleuths. There's a lot of internet sleuths that their information is watching the crime show on Oxygen or watching. Oh, uh, sec second hand. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And yeah. Then you're getting an opinion. You know, I just. Yeah, you know. that's the problem, and. You know, and, and not to cut you off, but I, I've seen, you know, a lot of people basically just quoting from Wikipedia or I've seen, um, you know, these there was one convention where there were, you know, you know, and, and God bless them. I, you know, hey, I want people to be interested in this stuff, but they two people just got on stage and they're sitting there reading from laptops. It's like, right, you know, right. You know, and and again, you know, I to me. And, you know, that's what people are saying. Well, what makes your Casey documentary different than others? Well, you know, I know there have been a lot out there, but I, I want to be a, a completist and, you know, leave no stone unturned. You know, I mean, mm. you know, I finally, you know, I eventually found the name of his dog, you know, everything. I want to know almost everything I can about the case, you know. Well, those things I think are key because when it, the books that I've written that I've gone out and I've met all the people that I could, I've uh, been to the place, you know, you meet the killer, you do all this stuff. Those books seem so much more complete to me than the yeah. ones that you don't. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and get this, you know, when I interviewed the prosecutor, uh, William Kunkel, I, when, I wasn't able to send him the questions beforehand or he didn't receive them. So before I interviewed him, I handed him the questions and he's going through them. He's like, where did you hear this? Where did you get this information from? I said, this information is all in the killer clown book. One of the biggest <laughs> books on Gacy and it's all inaccurate. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, none of these things happen. I'm like, but they're in the book. You know, all that stuff about Gacy's childhood. You know, he said he was raped and all these other things. You know, you can't, there's no proof of that. Where did that come from? You know mm. what I mean? It's ridiculous. Well, that's the downfall. And I think that's the, that's the sad thing because the podcast world, you know, there's so many crime podcasts and you can listen to them. Mm -hmm. And they're all just, they have a week to put together a show. They either pick up a book or they go to Wikipedia and kind of read off what they can. But there's no, it's not direct. You know what I mean? Right. So you right. get a lot of bad information out there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and you know, a lot of times they focus on the sensationalism aspect. And, like, when I interviewed Jason Moran, who's, you know, in charge of the, the you know, identifying the rest of the Gacy victims now, you know, he said that there's the truth in the case and there's sensationalism. And, you know, a lot of pe times the public will just know the sensationalism. But, you know, me and I'm sure you, you want to get to that truth. You want to get to that, that real truth. Like, okay, this was said in one book. Well, where did that come from? You know, and I, I've got to try and find it. If I don't find it, it most likely, you know, was made up. It was created you know, yeah, to be course. sensationalistic. Yeah. yeah. At a certain point, it just comes down to good journalism. I mean, you yes. need to, uh, you need to sort of set your parameter of what you're going to allow in and uh, get the lay of the land. And like Alan was saying, when you talk to a range of people, I feel when I've done journalism, usually the more input you get on a certain situation or scenario, uh, if it ranges across a series of perspectives and voices, you start to feel uh, through consensus across them that, okay, 
whether you're in the realm of opinion or fact, it's like, all right, now I'm starting to get a sense of what really happened. Exactly. You know, and, and you know, you, you know, there's these kernels out there and people have grabbed onto them and they become huge now. And, and people think they're the truth. You know, like I remember when I re released Albert Fish, where I definitively had in the film, I found the book of the executioner and he was there present and said nothing unusual happened, but people still want to hold on to this urban myth that the, all the pins and needles and fish shorted out the electric chair. And I even got into an argument with someone online that said, no, I believe that happened. I said, but wait, I have the book. I have the executioner who stood there and did it, and he said nothing unusual happened. But people like to believe some of these urban myths because they are more interesting sometimes or fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I saw it in a movie. It's true. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and those movies, too. That's the other thing. It's like, what? You know, <laughs> yeah. deciphering what's true and isn't in, in movies, you know? Yeah, you get that, you know, when we do the Zodiac show, episodes on the show. Oh. It's, it's a lot of times when people send in their messages. No, it's not true. We know who the killer is. I saw it on the movie. <laughs> right, right, right. And I'm like, oh, come on. You know? But that's you okay. Know. That's okay. Yes, That's okay. yes. I, I remember, you know, I watched one of these cable shows and they did it. It was on Richard Chase, but the entire show was just about all the gore, sensationalism, vampirism, drinking the blood. But never once did they say his mental issues and schizophrenia. So mm -hmm. it's like yeah. they just focus yeah. on that. And it's like eh, to me, I, I, you know, it's it's easy to do that, you know, yeah. and that's what Hollywood does. You know? When they yeah. took me down to do that oxygen show for the Killing Game book on Alcala, it was the same thing. It was four mm -hmm. days, they were filming all this stuff. Everything that was in there, they, I don't even know why they used me because uh, my book talked about all of his life, all of his dealings and what he went through and all this stuff. Uh, they didn't use any of that. It was yeah. just, just kill, 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 and yeah. it was over. And it's the same yeah. thing, I just did it for reals. It was much the same and now this, scary people for HLN. I know it's going to be the same thing, you know. Yeah. But, you know, and, and again, you know, I don't, what, what I do enjoy is I do enjoy when uh, I could appear in those shows because I just got, they're showing them now in France. I think it was the reels murder made me famous, um, you know, because then I'll get an uptick. I'll see a lot more friend requests on Instagram or Facebook. And someone just reached out and said, hey, I'm in France and I just saw you on TV. You know, yeah, uh, it's a good thing. I do too. Yeah. I noticed that. Yeah, but, that, but then I also get the ones that are. Would you like to make some money? <laughs> yes, right. Yes, right. that too. <laughs> yes, I know. I get a lot of that too. You know, but but again, you know, it's all good. You know, yeah. and again, it, hey, if it's their project, I don't bad mouth it. I, yeah. I, I, I'm, no. I love to appear in it and you know, help them out and we help each other and, and it's all good. You know, well, I all, just, it's all you know, yeah, yeah I, you know, and you know, when you like, when you do your books and when I do my films, we want to make sure that we're doing it our way. Yeah. 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 It's just, I think the very first one shocked me because uh, every time I kept on saying, well, no, that's not r exactly right. Or no, we can't do it this way or you shouldn't do yeah. it that way. Right. Uh, the producer would come over and say, listen, uh, we don't want people to turn the channel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. But you know what? And I'll tell you the truth. I mean, we have to be and I'm a truthful person. You know, when I was on one of these shows, you know, I had tried to bone up on my research as much as possible. And but when I got there, you know, if I had ever if I was stuck on something, I would tell them before we started filming. I'm like, look, I, you know, you ask me a question, I'll give you a response. But if there's something you want to hear, tell me to say it and I will. You know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. let's just make this easy for everyone. Yeah, yeah. You know, I want to be authentic, too, but that's not my program. You know, if, if, you know, if we're all working together on it, then it's like, you know, I'm, I'm going to give them what they want for that. You know, yeah. but I Real, tell Real's them, too, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Reels was good at that because the guy, yeah. he would say, okay, Al, say, say this, say that, say this. Yeah. We don't mind you. And I would say, so it's funny because you watch the beginning of the show here and it's, you hear my voice saying, they never saw it coming, right? They he had me say all these things and now I, I look back and I go, this is crazy because yeah. Yeah, I would never, but that's fine, whatever. Yeah. I, I realize that it's just, it's, it is about entertaining. And so they're only going to, they know their business, so they're going to show what they do. I'm just saying it was kind of a shock for me because 
I was thinking they were going to go through all the major details and no, no, I know they don't want to, but, the, but like I said, and I think that's, you know, kind of where we shine in our works because that's, what's going to differentiate my project from somebody else's where, you know, like I said, I want to believe me for a gay guy, he had bad taste. He had yellow green carpeting, yellow walls. <laughs> I was like, this oh, guy man. has no taste at all. Yeah. Or he kept on saying fruit picker. I'm not a fruit yes, picker. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. Yeah. But I love the story that, you know, he didn't like to be called a jag off, you know. Yeah. And that my favorite story is interviewing those cops when they said, yeah, you know, when we pulled them over, we grabbed them, pulled them out of the car. You stop driving like a jag off. He's like, don't call me that. Well, you're driving like one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they oh. told some great stories. I mean, you know, imagine this. You know, they're surveying him, you know, following him for, what, 10, 11 days. No thought. This is just a guy, whatever. And then, you know, the biggest case, one of the biggest yeah. cases ever. I mean, you know, even their story is fascinating. So I've got a whole surveillance section where they said they had to carry quarters in their pockets because the, there was no technology. They had to go to pay phones. So here they are chasing down John Wayne Gacy. <laughs> And they're they don't even can't even use their C D. Yeah. <laughs> like, to run to a phone. Yes. And, and you can't even find any phones anymore, right? There, you know, that's the thing. There's a lot of you know, the last time I, I've always loved Goodfellas, the movie. But oh, they, yeah. yeah, I saw it here at the Pickwick about a year or two ago and nice. you know, finally realized that it is a comedy because of that absurdity. You're laughing at how absurd it is because it is. You know, they've got a body in the back. They're saying this guy looks like the guy in our trunk where they're eating dinner with the mother. You're yeah. laughing at that absurdity. But Gacy's the same way early on. Yes, it's not laughing at the victims, but it's like, look at all these things the guy did. He built this miniature golf course in the prison. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, all these things are like, wait, he – it's it's crazy, you know. Yeah, usually, I mean, humor runs very close to to the extreme sort of painful parts of life. So you got to figure the more the, the darker you go, like you're, you know, the humor might get well, darker, but yes. it's, it's still always going to be there. Yeah. Yes, and that's why I tell people too. Like with with my documentaries, I always try to put something in there that will give people a laugh or chuckle because it is so deep. Like when I had Fish reading off his nasty letters talking about how he wanted to suck peanut butter out of a woman's behind, I'm like, people can't, can't they, they laugh because it's so extreme and absurd, you know? Yeah, it's almost like, it's funny, because when I just laughed just then and heard it, it's almost like a bodily reaction. Like it, it yes. passes your conscious awareness. Right. You're like, ah, oh, yeah. Right. You know, and when Panzram says that, you know, he had, he had more sodomy than Oscar Wilde did, it's like, that's a great line. <laughs> Right. You know? Yeah. What do you like, I mean, how else how can you react to that with a straight face? Like, oh yeah. Right. And you know, for, for a killer with a sixth grade education, he was very worldly and intelligent. So again, you know, they're each one of these guys I think, you know, they're they're tragic stories of what happened to them too, because like I tell people, when I interviewed Gacy's best friend, Barry Bashelli, he was on camera crying his eyes out because he said he has PTSD, thinking what didn't he see what could he have done you know so it doesn't just affect the murderer the victim but their families friends acquaintances it's just such a wide net of people that these cases affect yeah, yeah. that's the hardest thing when you're doing the book is when you're on the outside and you're kind of following how it's affected other people yeah yeah, and that's my tough part now with Gacy because, you know, obviously many of the people involved, you know, as far as families or others don't want to be involved. And I, I respect that, but I'll try at least, but I'll respect their, you know, uh, privacy as well. Yeah. Well, you kind of have to, you know. Yeah. But. yeah. So um, we are, geez, the hour is up. It goes so fast with you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's give out your information so people listening can find you. Yes, so my films are all streaming on Amazon Prime, so if you just type in my name, John Borowski, they'll come up, or like if you type in H.H. H. Holmes, I'm sure they're all linked um, on Amazon, and then my books are on Amazon, but my store, it's store.johnborowski.com, that's the best place uh, to for people to support me, whether you could make donations on the site or order products directly from me, which I could autograph and personalize. You know, for instance, a woman ordered an Ed Gein book for her friend and said, sign it as, I want to make a lampshade out of your skin because you light up my life. 
<laughs> so, you know, it, we have fun with that kind of stuff, obviously, because these are historical cases. But, you know, uh, and I sell other things on there, like I do a transparency of the fish x-ray. I have some case files and, you know, other things I sell on my website. And then my website is just my whole name, johnborowski.com. Great. We'll have that link up with our site. People can find you right off if they're listening. Great. And uh, and Grinder. Do you have a Grinder name or? Oh yeah, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 Big Johnny Boy. <laughs> oh, yeah. So you can find him on Big Johnny Boy yeah, yeah. on Grinder. It'll uh, be up later today. Yeah, he'll be. That's yeah, funny. Remember, he's Chicago time. So, you know. Right. Yeah, you know, I always I always tell people that you know Gacy picked his name Pogo because he was Polish and on the go. And I always say, well, I'm Polish and on the go too, but in a good way. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's a key distinction. Yeah. That's right. Po- po- Pogo go. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Well, thank you for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it and uh, love the House of Mystery and uh, always enjoy talking with you anytime. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.